spirit of good friends saying yes to invitations. I'm so excited to introduce you to our next solutions speaker, my friend Sarah Hurwitz. Yeah. So, um, Sarah currently serves as a special assistant to the president, where she has written speeches for both the President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. She's also a senior policy and strategy advisor for the White House Council for Women and Girls. And prior to her White House work, Sarah uh, was the chief speechwriter on Senator Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign and has written for the presidential campaigns of General Wesley Clark and Senator John Kerry. And so in the spirit of this conversation that we're having tonight, uh, Sarah is going to talk a little bit about um, how the words and our, the power of our words to shape the stories as we go into thinking about how do we shape the next narrative for women and girls in public office. Thank you so much. So thank you so much. It is great to be here. I want to thank uh, Aaron and Claire and Allison and Jess and everyone who made this possible. And uh, before I get started, I'm actually required by my job to give a somewhat awkward <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> I'm here in my personal capacity. Everything that I say represents my own views, not the views of the president or the White House. <laughs> so um, when I speak about what I've learned as a speechwriter about telling your story in a powerful way, that's actually me speaking, not the president of the United States. <laughs> I know that would have been very confusing for you all, so I just <laughs> Seriously, I'm here to talk about how you can tell your story and make your argument in a way that is authentic and impactful and persuasive. So, you know, the reality is that in today's media environment, it's really hard, right? The media environment, it's fragmented, it's polarized, it's noisy, and I think a lot of times it seems like only the most really extreme and shocking and base language really breaks through. But I can tell you that during my eight years writing for the president and for the first lady, I've seen time and again that the opposite is absolutely possible. You know, I've seen that language that is inspiring and empowering and informative, that articulates our highest values, like that can break through true. I know you guys have seen that as well. But the truth is that it's harder, right? Mm -hmm. It takes more heart, it takes more skill, it takes more thought, and it takes more courage. So today I want to offer four tips to help you do this. I want to offer some tips to help you communicate in a way that is authentic, <coughs> that's memorable, and that can actually break through all the noise. So the first tip, this is really the best advice I've ever gotten about speech writing, and it's really simple. Say something true. <laughs> um, it's funny, it seems really obvious, but I think a lot of times when people are speaking, the questions they ask themselves, they say, okay, what will make me look smart? What will be persuasive? What will be funny? What does the audience want to hear? And those are totally fine questions, but that is not your first question. That is not your foundational question. Your first and foundational question should be, what is true for me at this exact moment? And I would actually modify that by saying, what is bracingly true? What is uncomfortably true? Um, I'm a big fan of naming the elephant in the room when you speak. And I think that back in 2004, uh, Barack Obama, when he was running for Senate, he did this really well in his Democratic National Convention speech. He actually, he actually started this speech by saying the following. Let's face it, my presence on this stage is pretty unlikely. Wow, well, that's some truth, right? I mean, he's a black guy named Barack Hussein Obama, and he's on stage as a keynote speaker at a major party convention, and he named it. He owned it. He said what people were thinking. Um, I think the First Lady did this well in her 2016 convention speech when she talked about the beginning of her speech by sending her daughters off to the first day of school. She talked about them going into those SUVs with those big men with guns and with their faces are pressed up against the window. And she just thought to herself, what have we done? I mean, that is a very real and a very honest moment. And I think that when someone says something that is so glaringly true, you believe them, right? And you trust them. And you're more likely to listen to what they have to say. So, the, so tip number one is say something true. Uh, tip number two is talk like a person. And you know, so often in politics, we hear people speaking what, speaking in this, what my former colleague John Favreau, he calls a dead language. Um, we need to put hardworking American family values first. You know, the middle class is the middle of my priorities. Like, that's not English. Um, that should be, you know, what it is, is it's a very soundbitey, bland kind of language that Reagan speechwriter Peggy Newton once wrote, makes us all want to tear our faces off and run from the room. <laughs> um, I think if you were ever tempted to talk like that, I would really ask yourself, would a normal person say these things? And more importantly, would I normally say these things? Like, do I talk like this to my friend, my colleague, my partner? And if you wouldn't talk like that to one person, 
don't talk like that to many people. <laughs> <laughs> you will sound, you'll sound fake and no one will believe you. Talk like a person. Tip number three is a really important one. This is show, don't tell. Okay, this is a tip about adjectives versus images. So here's an example. This is the story of my friend John, version one. My friend John is so obsessive. Like, he's so exacting, he's so orderly, he's just, he's really neurotic and he's really uptight. <laughs> okay, that's my friend John. Here's version two of the story of my friend John. I once left my friend John alone in my kitchen for 20 minutes, and I re when I returned, he'd arranged all the spices in my spice rack in alphabetical order, <laughs> and he was busily lining up the magnets on my refrigerator by size and centering them using a tape measure that he carries with him everywhere. <laughs> okay, that's about images. So which description is more memorable? Um, you know, and that's actually, that's a fake story. I don't have a friend named John who does that. But a real example, which I think is very powerful, is something that the First Lady once said. She was speaking at a memorial service for Dr. Maya Angelou, and she was talking about how much Dr. Angelou's message and example meant for her when she was a little girl. And she could have gone on and on saying, you know, when I was a girl, there were hardly any images of black women's beauty on TV and magazines and movies, and that was really hard made me feel invisible, it was bad for my self-esteem to not see any images that look like me. And that's fine, right? That's it's moving, I guess you know, it's fine. But instead she said this, as a child, my first doll was Malibu Barbie. Wow, that's nine words. But what she's given you is this absolutely devastating image that I think conveys so much <coughs> of what she could have said in many, many more words. So the old cliche that a picture is worth a thousand words, that is particularly true in storytelling and speech writing. So I really need to focus on images instead of adjectives. Um, and the final tip, this is actually a piece of advice that the great political strategist David Axelrod, who is a dear friend and a mentor to me, he gave this advice to a colleague of mine. Um, my colleague was struggling with a speech. And David just turned to him and said, just write a love letter to America. Um, that might sound a little bit abstract, and it's, it's hard advice to get when you're a struggling speechwriter, but you know, we really knew what he meant, because it's really so important to convey your love and your respect for the people and the country that you want to serve. So, you know, when the president back in 2004 at the DNC speech, when he said, I stand here knowing that my story is a part of a larger American story, that I owe a debt to all of those who came before me, and that no other country on earth is my story even possible, like, that is a love letter to America. You know, when the First Lady said in her speech this year, her DNC speech, when she talked about the story of this country, and she said it was the story of generations of people who felt the last of bondage, the shame of servitude, the sting of segregation, but who kept on striving and hoping and doing what needed to be done so that today I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves, that is a love letter to America. And you really need to find that same connection between your story and the American story and you need to convey that same love and passion and patriotism. So you know, that's my advice as to how to effectively tell your story. And I'll tell you, I think these tips are particularly important for women who are running for office. Because at the end of the day, if you do not tell your story in a moving and vivid and authentic way that breaks through, others will tell it for you. Okay? And they may do so in a way that you do not like. And they may do so in a way that plays to really harmful stereotypes and biases. And I know that you'll be discussing that in the next panel. But you know, if I can leave you with one message today, I would tell you just not to lose heart, especially at what is a very difficult moment. Um, you know, I was preparing to come speak today. I was thinking about how the very idea of an organization like She Should Run that helps women run for office, like this would have been mind boggling to my mother when she was growing up. And I will tell you, it would have been utterly inconceivable to my grandmother. And that's really unfortunate because my grandmother, who passed away about five years ago at the age of 99, she was a very proud Roosevelt Democrat, and she was really passionate about social justice. <coughs> and as a young woman, she actually dreamed about going to law school and going into politics. Um, <clears throat> but she was a woman, born in 1912, and women back then did not have chances like that. But today, just two generations later, I have a law degree from Harvard University, and every day for the past eight years, I have walked through the northwest gate of the White House to go to work every morning. So, you know, I would tell you, while this is a really challenging time, we have a platform unlike any generation of women in the history of this country. And I think if we are willing to step up and just make our voices heard, 
you know, if we're willing to put ourselves out there and tell our stories, and if we can get a critical mass of really strong and smart and dedicated and patriotic women who are breaking through and shaping our national conversation, I really think we have a fighting chance here. And you know, that is the mission of She Should Run. It's why I love this organization. And I just want to end by thanking everyone at She Should Run for the work that you're doing. I want to thank all of you for being here to support that work. And I am really excited to see what we all do together in the years ahead. Thank you.